Hello from Estonia, and welcome to a brand new season of the Startup in Estonia podcast, produced by Startup Estonia and hosted by me, Adam Rang. You know, a lot has changed in the world since the last season, and we had to ask ourselves, should we dedicate this season to topics around the pandemic, you know, how to build your startup during a pandemic? And our conclusion, based on listening to startup founders, is no. Um, you know, sure, these are like really extraordinary, tough and weird times in which we are all learning to adapt. And I don't want to minimize like the impact of this global pandemic. But building a startup has always been tough. It's always involved adapting. So we all have a duty to keep ourselves and each other safe. But many startup founders also feel that duty to keep on growing their businesses too. And the world needs you to do that more than ever. Um, regardless of like whether you're working on a startup to save the world or you know just make life slightly easier for some people. And I know it can be lonely building a business, especially uh, during a pandemic, during social distancing. But we've got to keep finding smarter ways to connect, to share our experiences, to open up with each other. And that's actually one of many things that I think makes our startup ecosystem really special here in Estonia. We're a very close-knit community and we look out for each other and we're always happy to welcome more people into our community. So we're really glad you decided to switch on this podcast and please do tweet us along the way using the hashtag Startup in Estonia while you're listening. But otherwise, you know, it's business as usual for us too. So in this season three, we're going to talk to more amazing founders of startups, both large and small, uh, to hear their perspective and get some, valuable, get some valuable advice from them based on what they did right and just as importantly, what they did wrong. So in each episode in this season, it's going to focus on a different aspect of building a successful startup with a guest who has some very valuable advice to share around that topic. In today's show, we want to find out how to create a compelling company story for your startup. You know, every company has a story, and a good one can be a cornerstone of good marketing and PR. It can in both inspire customers and investors. It can foster a deeper understanding of you and your product, as well as add greater trust and familiarity to your business which helps you know, more people want to do business with you. It can also inspire your employees and, and motivate them. The problem, though, is that if you don't tell your story, then someone else might do it for you. Perhaps a co-founder you split from after a disagreement or perhaps a cynical journalist. And their story about your company might become the dominant public narrative, whether that's deserved or not. Now, All of us here, when we thought of like, when we thought that we wanted to cover this topic, we all thought of the same person that we really wanted to get here um, and and share his advice on the subject. And I'm so happy to say that he managed to take time out of his busy schedule to join us. Rain Ranu is an amazing startup founder and angel investor who not only has a really interesting story of his own, but he knows a lot about creating good stories because he's now an equally successful filmmaker. So. Welcome to the podcast, Rain. Hello, glad to be here. And you actually took, today you took time out of your schedule from filming a movie to come down here. Yeah, actually we are um, in the pre-production of, uh, of my next film. So we're going to film it uh, um, this month and it should be out uh, next year. That's great. And Rain, your first big success that people know you for was uh, for Tumo, um, the mobile payments platform that's still helping a lot of other businesses grow. Like, what's your own company's story from there? Well, it actually started um, about 20 years ago. Hmm. Uh, we were students at the university and we had a university course where uh, uh, we had to play when creating the product. Uh, and I think my team, our team was the only one who kind of misread uh, um, uh, the, the assignment we were given uh, because we actually made the product and we started selling it. And, uh, and we found out that uh, the team that we uh, by accident formed during that, uh, that school assignment at the university was actually a really good team and we wanted to do stuff together. And then we decided that, okay, we're going to make it a real company and we're going to start offering uh, different mobile services. So that company became Mobi. Out of Mobi, a few years later, grew Fortumo. And then, uh, uh, you know, afterwards, many, many other companies that are successful now, like Mesenta, Mobilab, uh, 
and uh, and and others and, and all those people or most of those people that, that that we got us together 20 years ago by accident in a startup course actually now still together and and, and working in this uh, uh, one unit each running its uh, his or own own business so it's and you're you're mostly based in Tartu. Uh, for those that don't know, Estonia's university town. We started out in Tartu, and I'm originally from Tartu. We met at the Tartu University, and and right now uh, for Fortuma, uh, most of Fortuma's team uh, is also uh, yes, it's based in Tartu. A few people in Tallinn, and uh, and few others in in about uh, six or seven different countries all around the world. But but Tartu is the main hub. But for me myself. Um, I meanwhile I, I lived a few years in San Francisco Bay Area and now I'm uh, back in Estonia and in, in Tallinn. Great, and you also founded Super Angels. Uh, so you support early stage startups with um, with not just finance but mentoring, um, co working space, uh, business development as well. well. Why did you want to transition from being a startup founder yourself to helping others? Well, I think uh, you know. Then, yeah, you know, kind of continue along the lines of my story, like out of a Mobi group for Tuma, which is basically a global mobile payments provider. We, we realized uh, back then that not many people, in, if you look like globally, there are 7 billion people, but, uh, but only like less than 1 billion back then had credit cards. And already 3 billion, 4 billion uh, were starting to have mobile phones. So we realized that uh, to offer payments with a mobile phone in emerging markets is actually a very, very lucrative and very interesting uh, business. And we started uh, doing that. You know, there were a lot of you know, stories tend to be simple and straightforward, but uh, but usually in real life there are many zigzags. Uh, but we finally like ended uh, ended up one of the um, top um, carrier billing providers for the likes of Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and and many many others. So. Uh, I ran that company uh, until 2014-15 and uh, then I kind of realized that uh, I also wanted to make movies and I also wanted to help uh, more companies than just one and I realized that if I was a full-time CEO of a company then it's not possible to make movies on the side or even like spend a lot of time with uh, younger and other startups so I had to make some decisions and then about five, six years ago, my decision was that, okay, I'm not going to run the startup anymore. Luckily, we had an uh, awesome team. We had my co-founder, Martin Koppel, who was really up for the task of, uh, of running the company. And I decided that I can, I can focus on, on, on another thing, like investing and, and making movies for a while. So, so that's why the transition from a founder to first investor and then later on also a movie maker happened. And when most people have heard of an elevator pitch, the idea that you should be able to tell your whole story of who you are and what you're offering in the time that you can ride in an elevator with someone. You've taken that to a whole new extreme, uh, jumping out of planes, I understand. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, I mean, um, yeah, that's that's a kind of like a stunt we have done at Super Angel. And, and to be very honest, uh, it's... It's mostly a marketing stunt mm -hmm. because like uh, nobody, no investor would actually make a decision to invest in a startup based on a pitch that you would deliver while jumping out of the airplane. So wh why that came about this uh, is that basically um, as a founder, you do have to push yourself and you have to perform well in unexpected situations. So that was a good metaphor to actually uh, put people in sort of like uncomfortable situations and actually make them, you know, tell their company story. So, so yeah, it was fun. And, uh, and we did that a few times and, and it worked really well. Mm. But, uh, but it, it, it's not how venture funds these days typically make decisions. It's a very, very uh, more boring process. Mm. How we actually decide into which startup to invest and into which not to invest. But in theory, everyone should be able to tell their story in the time it takes you to jump out a plane. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I mean, the classic idea of the elevator pitch is that uh, you tell your startup story so simply that if you have just 10 minutes, 10 seconds with an investor on a parking lot or in an elevator, then you can tell it. So, yeah, I think every, every founder has and uh, has that story. And, uh, and I think, yeah, 
mm, you know, for us, it's four to more. It, it's very simple. Like four billion people have mobiles, one billion have credit cards with mobile payments. You can uh, uh, reach so many more people than you can use with credit cards. And we are one of the top providers of mobile payments in emerging markets using career billing. So um, it was that's a bit great. rough, but, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of like like how we mm, told the Fortum story in, in 10 seconds. And if anyone wants to see the videos of people jumping out of planes while making their pitch, I guess they are on YouTube if you search Super Angels um, jumping out of planes pitching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we also took it to the next level, actually. Oh, really? So, yeah. Well, I mean, what is the next level from <laughs> that? We had, a, we had a granny pitch, hmm. which is that, okay, not only you should be able to tell it in, in 30 seconds, but yeah. you should be able to tell it in such a way that uh, grandma understands it. That is the toughest one of all. It's pretty tough, yeah, because I haven't managed it, actually. When mm. I go to visit my grandma and <laughs> grandpa, then they always uh, ask how my business is doing. But like in 20 years, they, they never understood what my business is actually doing. It is something related with like computers, but, uh, but other than that, it's very, very hard to pitch. Mm. And uh, I mean, I don't think you should always be able to pitch it uh, to, to grannies because some businesses are more complicated. But um, but I think it is important to at least try to put it in a language that the ordinary people uh, understand because, uh, you know, a lot of your customers, typically they are just ordinary people. And, and, and I think even the most complex things can be somewhat simplified so that, uh, that the story uh, would be more compelling. So is it important to keep adapting your story for different audiences? Like even say the story you tell to your customers versus the story you tell to your employees um, versus investors? Do you have to keep di giving different versions or should people be sticking to one kind of solid narrative? I think there is um, the, the same story, but it's always like different aspects of that story. So, you know, very, very rarely, I mean, you can't, tell an oppositely different stories, uh, but, but very rarely, clearly that the story you tell maybe your employees uh, is way more detailed than the story you, you tell customers typically. So I, I do think there are different versions of it. And you offer co-working space as well in Tallinn. I just want to ask about that at the moment because obviously during these times, kind of like, um, is co-working still the future? Is How is the pandemic affecting uh, your offices there at the moment? Uh, yeah, so uh, our Super Angel Fund, uh, we have this co-working space uh, called Palo Alto Club here in Teleskivi. Um, look, I think especially now in, in pandemic, uh, uh, I think w w what we all had to go through is that, you know, during at least one or two months and, and in some countries like in US, uh, uh, it's, it's been much longer and it's going to go on. You, you couldn't work at your office and you had to adopt to adapt to a new or different working environments. And some companies found out that... Uh, uh, like this is temporary and when it's possible they return to the office but many companies actually liked aspects of it so what we, we start seeing now is that companies are saying that okay we still want an office we still need an office uh, but we maybe only need it for one day a week mm. or we need it for two days a week uh, and we want to have a more flexible working relationship so I think co-working spaces in particular have a have a place in this uh, more uh, flexible environment where um, people don't need as big an office and maybe they don't need uh, um, to have it you know, all the time, but co-working places can actually uh, be more flexible in, mm. in this new working environment. Mm. Yeah. You know, I remember I used to work at home uh, and it can get really lonely. And then I did sign up to a co-working space, Lyft 99 actually just over here, and it made such a huge difference. And it's not so much that I needed the space to work. It was just being around other people, going through similar journeys was like, uh, it was so important, uh, even like for your mental health as well. And, um, you know, I didn't go there every day. Uh, I didn't, I didn't always get my most productive work done there. Sometimes I did play a bit too much ping pong, um, but actually just to be able to like relax with people in the middle of working and talk to them about the issues you're going through, just so valuable as well. And yeah, it's a real shame during this pandemic that so many people around the world are missing out on that sense of community. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping kind of we can get back into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, clearly, um all the pandemic is temporary and uh, and it will change some things like we all gonna do more zoom calls and we got this uh, understanding that it is possible to uh, you know work globally even the companies who maybe didn't do it before mm. uh, but but still you know look we we need to and we want to connect with other people and once in a while and uh, and office or a co-working space is a perfect place to do it still 
So, Rain, kind of going back, like, where did the idea to become a filmmaker come from? That's an unusual career path along the way of uh, being a startup founder. Mm. I think, you know, if you think back, like I was in kindergarten or first grade and during the breaks, I was already like... Uh, um, directing theater or movies or whatever we did with classmates and I was always like behind the camera behind the scenes uh, so I think it was kind of all in me a long time and kind of been came back but uh, but I think you know more specifically around 2012 2013 um, Fortuma was becoming more and more like uh, you know back end or more like we were more technical and we got more deeper into the like um, you know technology and uh, and actually I wanted to to do something that's more creative, where mm. you can actually be hands on, and uh, and I was striving to do something creative. And filmmaking happened to be the perfect uh, area because with a lot of other creative things, like if you want to do a, be a composer, you have to be really good in music yourself, and if you want to be a painter, you have to be able to paint very well. But um, being a film producer, you you kind of are like a startup founder, meaning that you gather around you a lot of talented people and you can still make a movie without actually being, you know, the best cinematographer or best, uh, you know, sound person or best artist. Uh, but you can, you know, be kind of like founder, a generalist uh, who, who just got a great team and, and then makes a movie. Mm. So it was kind of like perfect outlet uh, for me to experiment where I could um, pretty much approach it the way that uh, I had previously approached building startups which is that, uh, you know, you just uh, get an idea and you just learn by doing. You start out making it and then see what happens. And and that's kind of how uh, you know, I have always approached making uh, startups and making new products is that you just start doing it and you see where it takes you. And your movie production company is California. Um, and how did that come together? Who else is involved in that? Yes, so California, it's basically me and my partner, Tonu Hielait. So uh, he is a main, main producer uh, and, and I do too, too many roles. So yeah, it's basically like a small startup of, of two people. And our story or our goal is that uh, we, we kind of feel that uh, we want to bring the startup like mentality to making movies. Mm. And if you think of Estonian movie industry, then I, I like to think that um, in, in general, we are like a startup industry 10 years ago when we had some earlier success stories. Like, uh, you know, we had uh, back then mm, companies that uh, were very successfully selling their products abroad through Ericsson's network or Nokia's network or through some other big company. But we were not yet there where we could, uh, we, we had this, this, our own startups. And then Skype came along and suddenly people got the impression that, okay, you can make an own startup in Estonia. And then after that, uh, we have like 500 startups at least uh, who are doing great things uh, abroad. So I think our movie industry is a little bit not there yet. And, uh, but it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. And we want to be part of bringing that about where we can actually, you know, make movies and tell stories from Estonia that have a global audience in a similar way that our startups right now have a, have a global user base. Because one thing I noticed that was unusual for a movie is that you did a crowdfunding campaign for um, the, the latest movie for the production of it. Like, what was the benefit of that? I mean, obviously, kind of you got finance from it, but what else? Why did you decide to do that? Um, yeah, I mean... In movie business, it's it's not like it's so uncommon, but it's, maybe it's an uncommon in Estonia because mm. typically, you know, how, how, how you traditionally approach it, but not so much in US. But I think the key thing uh, was crowdfunding always is to, to test an audience and build an audience. So our, our thinking was that for the type of movie we make made Chasing Unicorns, there's a very big uh, startup audience and the people who would really appreciate it and maybe like it. And then we wanted to reach them and get the message out to them early on. From your perspective as an investor, how are you rethinking investments and what kind of startups are hot? And um, I guess customer behavior is changing too. Industries are being disrupted. Uh, so there's so much adaption taking place. Like, what are your thoughts about what makes a good investment at the moment? I think, you know, fundamentally, what was good investment six months ago is still a good investment in most cases. Okay. Because we all realized that uh, the... Um, uh, the time frame we are looking when we are investing in a startup at Super Angel, it's like five years, 10 years, mm. 20 years. 
And we know that uh, the COVID is temporary. So like uh, it's going to be like maybe one year, maybe two years max, but uh, but it will go away uh, eventually by vaccines or however, however you get there. So we, we, we still think about like what's a good business in five years and what's a good business in 10 years. And typically the answer is not very different than it was six months ago. Of course, um, mm, but people are starting to realize more that if you are very much tied to a physical space with many people, then uh, then you have bigger risks. So certain travel businesses are right now maybe maybe less of a good investment because like we we didn't think two years ago that something like this could happen, but uh, but now it has happened, and now if you were an airline owner or a, or a like a big hotel owner in a city, you would be in a big big problem because. Uh, you, you are so much affected mm. by that. And as investors, you know, you, you might think that, okay, what's the next next event that could be as disruptive, like five or 10 years, and, and, and you know, which businesses are more protected and which are less protected. But in most cases, and in, in definitely in all of the on, online businesses, the answer is rather uh, that, uh, that there's no change or even the change is maybe for the better. So... I mean, what about like the relevance of um, Silicon Valley itself as a kind of fixed location to do business? Um, I, I know we're a bit biased at being startup Estonia and saying, you know, you should start your company in Estonia. But actually, like, you know, we're also very proud of our links to Silicon Valley. And, you know, you can get the you can get advantages from both. You can get the best of both worlds. Is Are we going to see more people working remotely? Is Silicon Valley, uh, you know, is the cost of being in Silicon Valley going to have to go down? Or how do you see Silicon Valley adapting to this? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, uh, definitely. And we've seen this change already quite quite a bit over the last 10 years. Like when I, when I lived there, like seven, eight, nine years ago, then it was still considered to be like maybe one of the only places in the world where you could build or scale a successful startup. But I can see like it being less and less so over the years. So Silicon Valley as a like, like a mind state or as a, concept like or, or a set of methods how to build a startup and this is still there but uh, but you can get that globally and you can get that anywhere uh, so that you know we as, how we build startups in Estonia we are bu- still building them a lot in a Silicon Valley way but uh, but we don't have to be physically in Silicon Valley to do it and I think maybe COVID accelerates that to a certain degree because right now even if you're located in Silicon Valley you're still working at home And if you work at home, you could work at home from many different places where maybe the quality of life uh, as compared to cost is much higher, both within the US or or internationally. And and clearly, uh, I see that uh, the concept of uh, of Silicon Valley anywhere or being able to build a successful startup uh, from Estonia or for any place in the world without ever physically visiting Silicon Valley is, is much more realistic than it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. And you, you know, you personally have seen so many successful companies um, come out of Estonia. You, and kind of, so the main, uh, so this episode, we're looking at like how to create a compelling company story. And out of what you've seen, like how important is it that successful founders have a good company story to tell about themselves, where they came from, why they're building their products? Uh, well, definitely. I mean, every company has a story. And, you know, the simplest way of a company story is if you go to the company website mm. and you get the story like in, in 10 seconds. That's mm. kind of like the elevator pitch that when you went to the California website, you got a certain uh, story, not only what was written on that page, but you also looked at how the page was made and you kind of got the idea of the whole mentality of, of like what we do. Mm. So every company has that. And, 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 and you know, this story um, is there whether you want it or not. And, and you always tell a story. You tell the story when when you when you meet uh, investors. You tell the story when you meet the customers. You want it or not. So, I think um, mm, and that's a very big big part. And of course, like some companies have a very very clear origin story. Like you know, globally, a lot of people probably know the Netflix origin story, which probably uh, I've heard or read that it's not true. But but everybody tells it, which was basically that the founder Reed Hastings uh, uh, rented a DVD from Santa Cruz's local DVD store and he forgot to bring it back uh, and like he went to, and took it back 24 uh, days later and then he had a huge late fee 
and then uh, he decided that this is so unfair and he he built the company Netflix based on that uh, that would never charge late fees so you heard those stories or in Estonia we all know the transfer wise origin story where there were two friends uh, one needed to send um, McTavet needed to um, get got paid in euros and needed pounds uh, to live in London and Krista got paid in pounds in London but needed euros to pay the mortgage in Estonia and you and you know there were so high fees to change it through banks so this they decided to do it in a peer-to-peer way by swapping each other and then they found out that more people had the similar needs and then they found it transfer wise and the rest is history so you hear a lot of those origin stories and these are great these are often you know there's some truth to it and probably they are like very much a simplified versions of uh, what what the actual events were and 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 those stories are famous and and you need them but even if you don't have an origin story you still need a compelling story of what are you now where are you going and why should i be your customer and and that story happens regardless of whether you tell it yourself or or whether whether somebody else tells it for you or it just happens Transferwise is an interesting example because I I don't just hear that story from Transferwise. I hear it from a lot of other people, including just other customers who are recommending Transferwise. And I guess that's like the ultimate success when your customers can repeat your story to other people. Um, and I also sometimes like I've been you know on YouTube and I get served adverts by Transferwise. I'm clearly their kind of target market. I get served adverts by them with their company story in it. Um, and I just think it, it's told so effectively. So I, I, yeah, I really do think TransferWise is kind of like an excellent example of how to mm-hmm. tell your story and tell it over and over and over again. Yeah, and I think that that's a key point because uh, uh, whatever story you, you have, you have to tell it over and over and over again. Mm. I mean, that, that's a key point uh, is that if you repeat it in every medium, in every way, in every chance you get, uh, then it then it sticks you have, may have the best story, but if you don't tell it to anybody, then then it doesn't stick. So so that's that's clearly, you know, no the big part. And yeah, I think the second, you know, there are many components of a cool story, and we can dig a bit t- deeper mm, into it. But uh, but other other thing f- about why transfer fee story and Netflix story are both great is that it's a very simple story, and everybody can understand or relate to it. And even if they've never had to change uh, euros to pounds, they still can can believe and relate to that story, and still you know tell it. And if you have had that problem, if you've seen some expensive exchange rates somewhere, you know when you were traveling, or or th- then you relate even more. So that's a very very effective story because it's it's so simple and it's told over and over again. You know, I once uh, spoke to a PR person for a politician who said. Once you're sick of telling your story so many times, that's when you know it's just starting to get through to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I also use this, like, uh, I write a lot about startups. And so I often quickly go to a website of a startup I haven't heard of before. I have a quick look up uh, what they do because I just want to kind of write one or two sentences, just very quickly summing them up. And sometimes, yeah, I go to their website and I can't actually put that sentence or two together. And then what I do is I go to Wikipedia, um, the company's mm. profile on Wikipedia, and then I can much more easily find a very succinct summary of kind of what the company is and what it does, like in plain language. Um, so I think that's uh, that's the Wikipedia test startups need to think about. Like if a journalist or anyone is going to be writing about your company, can they figure it out by looking at your homepage for a few seconds or do they have to go to Wikipedia and read what someone else has written about your company? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, they always, um, all the stories, they never tell the whole truth. I mean, they simplify. Mm. And uh, and also there's this thing, I think, you know, in startups, we talk a lot about product market fit, but there's also like a story market fit in a way that uh, when you're telling your story, you have to test it with, with people, with customers, investors, journalists. Uh, and uh, only then you find your story if it resonates with the listeners and other people. And, and it's very important to, to test multiple versions of the story and see which one resonates uh, mm-hmm. with the audience. And then that's your story. Mm-hmm. Even though, like, to get to that to- story, you maybe have to leave certain important aspects out or some aspects out that you think are important but mm-hmm. really don't resonate. So all the good stories are... A simple and you have to find the story story market fit i think it's the same way then you have to find the product market fit and you know one of the other tests i i often do myself and i recommend to startups is that when they are writing your 
press release about your investment or a product or, or whatever, then already write it as a, as a journalist, mm-hmm. writing an article about it. Mm-hmm. So cut out all the passwords, cut out all these things that journalists or other people wouldn't write and, and, and try to put yourself already in this third person, the journalist or the reader. And how, how would they want to, what they would want to know about your company by reading this press release or article. And that's actually a really good test because it helps you very much clarify your communication and your story. If- so this is like the copy and paste test. If a journalist will copy and paste what you've written about your company, then uh, you're telling it kind of like in plain English. Because they're obviously going to want to delete all the kind of, um, yeah, the kind of marketing bits. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do it. And maybe, I mean, oftentimes, actually, in reality, they have so little time and patience that they mm-hmm. might discard their whole press release if it's just a marketing pitch. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly, it should be written in plain English. Right. Like, a good story needs good characters. And, you know, so, some startup founders love talking about themselves. Um, others kind of, you know, maybe they're shy or maybe they just want to focus on the product and they don't want to be kind of, they don't want to distract from their company. Like, does a good startup story have to be a personal story? Does it have to have like human faces of the founders or can you still have a good startup story that doesn't involve the founders if that's not the style they want to go for? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, if, if you think about all the most successful stories or startups of, of the last decade, then almost always you can also name a founder. Of course, there are some examples, like I don't know if many people know Zoom's founder yet or, or you know, maybe Stripe's founder. You know, I mean, in, in certain circles they're known, but they're not maybe as known as Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg. But oftentimes um, uh, people associate startups with founders, and that is a good reason, uh, because founder oftentimes is the most the biggest driving force, especially if you think about the most successful companies. There would not be a Tesla or SpaceX without Elon Musk, or there wouldn't be a Facebook without Mark Zuckerberg. So they are they are very much interlinked. But of course, uh, that can work both ways. Like right now, uh, if you try to like Facebook is what, like 15 years old. Mm-hmm. But if you still think that everything Facebook does is the extrapolation of what Mark Zuckerberg is as a person, then you might get into the places where, you know, that are not, not true or accurate, or, or maybe you don't want to go there necessarily because, uh, uh, you know, Facebook, what they have like 50,000 people now, and that there are so many decisions happening in all kinds of levels. And, uh, and, and the founder is obviously the face of it, uh, but still like, you know, you cannot think that everything Facebook does is it does because Mark thinks that you know this is him as a person and this you know how the company should be like. So it's kind of like double-edged sword in a way mm. that uh, that uh, that you know you know good, good startup stories they focus a lot on founders. Facebook's a really interesting example because like it's you know it's a company I use every day constantly. It's it's never really been like a good example of a story for me because the origin always seems a bit murky. Then obviously in recent years, there's been lots more controversy um, and yet they've been successful despite that. And and actually I was thinking there's, you know, another movie, uh, The Social Network. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've seen that, but it doesn't paint Facebook in a good light. And so kind of Facebook's origin story is kind of being defined for them. Is that kind of a danger that you see that where companies kind of, yeah, they get that kind of negative publicity and, or, or maybe there's some kind of big storyline, a real storyline um, where like they have a falling out with another founder or partner or something, or maybe there's a problem with customers or something. And, um, and then it kind of, it comes, it becomes a big part of their company story. Is, uh, you know, have you experienced these kind of problems with founders before who struggle to control their own narrative about their company? I think it's very hard to control your own narrative mm, because, you know, always, uh, um, mm, especially if you're successful, then it, it becomes increasingly hard to control your narrative because, uh, you know, there are so many people who are interested in, you know, also owning or controlling the narrative. Uh, and I think with Facebook or with the social network, um, I think um, the movie is great and I really love the movie, actually. And it's one of the best startup movies ever made still. Uh, but what was very interesting was that Facebook at first, and Mark Zuckerberg at first didn't like it at all that mm. they're making the movie and they're making it from that angle. But actually when the movie was finished and when it was in cinemas then mark invited all the employees of facebook 
to watch the movie. Mm, so right. he kind of owned the story back then, uh, and uh, and it worked very well for him because he, I think he realized that you cannot control the story fully. Of course, you can you know push the elements you like, but eventually your story is defined a lot by reality. It's defined by your products. It's defined by what you really are and what your company really is and what it does. And you cannot control all aspects of it. Mm. But but sometimes it makes sense to not like fight it, but uh, but own parts of it. And then you, mm, you know, you, you I think you actually win. I mean, I think mm. that movie benefited Facebook uh, quite a bit because uh, it was a true story told authentically. And in the end, you know, it was not maybe the most flattering on Mark as a person, but I do think it did benefit Facebook as a company. You mentioned Elon Musk. Um, is it possible that like one um, personality in within a story can be too dominant, can be bigger than the company? Um, yeah, absolutely. But to be very honest, Elon Musk is right now quite a big exception because he has single-handedly, I mean, I think if you think about like the founder's role in creating the success, then there are maybe only a handful of uh, like tech founders, uh, like maybe Jeff Bezos is another guy, maybe Mark Zuckerberg, that have been so much behind the success of, of Tesla and SpaceX. Meaning that, uh, you know, if it was like almost any other guy, then he would never have a, you know, audacity or like wish to, mm, uh, to have such a vision to change the, the space industry, meaning that, you know, before everybody thought that to, to make a space company, you had to be a government and mm. he was leading the forefront, you know, uh, that you can do it privately and he successfully executed. And then others followed, like, I mean, Jeff Bezos was other guy in space who kind of did at the same time was less publicity maybe, but Elon did it in space. And then he did it at the same time was also cars, electric cars, when there was no American made car company mm -hmm. for the last like what hundred years. And, uh, and there was no electric car company that was successful and he decided to do it and he executed successfully again. So I think in Elon Musk's case, uh, it's quite well deserved that it has got so much it attention mm. and uh, and of course that's a double-edged sword because elon is just a person and uh, and he has also weaknesses and, and maybe some notable weaknesses that have also sometimes negative effect on those companies so if elon goes to a podcast and uh, you know smokes weed which is even though it's legal in California, but if you're running a space company and you spoke weed publicly, then that might not be good for your reputation and for that space company. Or if you tweet out that the price of your car company stock is overvalued mm -hmm. yeah. and then the stock falls like 10% um, the next day, then, you know, that might not also be you know, a good thing. So, um, but, but, but I do think that in, in those cases, um, uh, and also in a lot of early stage startups, when the role is, of the founder is uh, is really big, then it's justified if they are part of the story so much, because without that person, that those companies would never exist or be that successful. So you kind of have to accept that uh, uh, downside that they're just people. Mm. Well, I'm not going to offer you weed during this podcast. Um, so your most recent movie is Chasing Unicorns, and like, it's genuinely one of my favorite movies. Um, it's kind of uh, maybe I'll let you give uh, an overview of the movie. Hmm. Yeah, so Chasing Unicorns came out last year in Estonia. It's about uh, two startup founders, uh, you know, trying to make it. And, and my, my drive was actually to give an authentic picture of uh, what it might be like to build a startup, you know, starting from, from a place other than Silicon Valley. So we collected a lot of uh, stories of, of real Estonian startups, used some of our own, my own stories, and, and we created a fictional narrative of, uh, of how, how, how it is to build a startup. So which, which famous startups are, have their stories in the movie? So earlier we talked about the granny test and there is actually a scene when, mm -hmm. um, you, when the founders are talking to elderly relatives trying to explain a very funny scene, trying to explain what an algorithm is and what their startup does. Um, 
which company was that? Was that from your experience? Or? That was a different company. Uh, yes. So, and, and the funny thing about this, the scheme was parents. Uh, like um, after the movie was released, like at least three different startups came to me and said, like, how do you know our story was parents? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't. Uh, because a lo lot of them have had it. Uh, mm. Like most notably, I think, uh, for Polt or Taxify, the first investors were actually the parents of the founders. And they put, put in, I think, like 5,000 euros. And they were really nervous. They thought that, you know, they're going to lose the money. And then mm, suddenly it started to become successful. And then uh, then they got their investment back, like, with um, at least 100 or maybe, like, 500 times return. And and still, like, they were, like, the more successful it became, the more nervous they became because kind of, like, the stakes were higher. And I understood that they did sell their stake mm. so that they could... Um, you know, get the money and uh, and uh, and be have a peace of mind, and now they have used this money to give uh, grants and stipends to other young people trying to do their own companies. So, so yeah, that that type of that story is very very real. This algorithm story, I think, it came from all, another founder, uh, and and you know, there are very many bits and pieces, but but all the characters and all the things in the movie are, are fictional and they're composites of many things typically so i don't know if you know this rain but i am one of the stars of this movie um maybe star is a bit of an exaggeration because i'm in the movie for less than a second but mm -hmm. i'm uh, i'm an extra in there's a scene at latitude 59 which is estonia's mm -hmm. uh, startup and uh, a technology uh, conference and yeah, we all do a very good job, I think, of playing the role of people attending Latitude 59 because we really are attending Latitude 59. You, you came, mm -hmm. it's been two years ago now and, and yeah. filmed it. That was a really great experience. Yeah, I think, and, and we really did it in a guerrilla way because we mm. thought that, you know, to, to put it together the normal way, uh, we would have to get like, you know, 200, 300 extras in one room, uh, provide them food and, you know, do it all the hard way. So we thought that, you know, it's it's too hard, too expensive. So why not, uh, you know, try to almost like steal it. So we came to the real Latitude 59, we filmed the audience uh, and then when the conference was over, we were trying to lock the doors and tell everybody <laughs> to stay in so that we could film for 15 more minutes. Uh, and uh, we got a large chunk of people uh, staying and then we had uh, the Johan Nurup, the actor who played the investor, we had him take the stage and give a real speech. Uh, I mean, you were there, you heard it probably mm. like three or four times mm, for different angles, we, we took it and, and we filmed it uh, right at the real latitude uh, at the end of the, of the real conference. So that's kind of like the startup way of, of filmmaking and, and also it, uh, it gives this authenticity that, uh, that maybe we wouldn't have had if we had uh, tried to stage the whole thing. And I enjoyed your previous movie too, actually, which is Chasing Ponies. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's about an experience which is familiar to a lot of Estonians, which is selling books door to door in the US, something you've done as well. Um, so was that also based on, you did similar kind of research then, your own story based on research you, you gather, stories you gather from other people you were there with? Yeah, absolutely. We did that uh, that that one also in a similar way. And uh, and for, for me, that was a really like guerrilla startup type of filmmaking because I had no experience of being in any film set. So I had never even visited the film set. And like my first day filming of that movie was my first day ever doing it. Hmm. So we had a really small crew of uh, five or six people plus a few actors. And we bought tickets to US uh, for three weeks. So when we got there, we had a script. Uh, we had our crew. And we had a return ticket three weeks from from the date, and we had to find everything in between, meaning locations, extras, uh, um, and you know everything that is in the movie, and and that was really, for me, a great way to get the film school type of experience in a really condensed period. And so you, you you've never been to film school then? Or? No, no, I have no no film training. Ah. I, I watched movies, but uh, I never like even had no idea how to make one before so you I started just by one. going and doing it. Yeah, yeah, that's what we did. And what was kind of what was the biggest lessons you learned from the first movie to the second one? Then, well, I mean, there were so many of them because like you, you make every movie four times. You make when you write it, you make when you shoot it, and when you edit it, and then when people actually see it. And in every uh, every stage, there were so many aha moments. But uh, 
what I really liked about the way I did it is that, you know, typically you would get a lot of that in three or four years in film school, but we mm. were able to get it basically in one year when making the movie. And, and we had so much fun uh, doing it. So I think there were a lot of things. So, so the next one, the teaching unicorns, we tried to um, make some things way more professional, but still retaining that independent guerrilla spirit, like, like going to, being able to go to the latitude conference or the latitude after party and, and shoot in real locations. So we try to balance it more. And uh, I think, you know, that's what I really enjoy about it is that if you, if you can be super effective and, and, and use real locations and real people and real situations, but also somehow being able to make it look uh, professional uh, mm. as, as a real movie and have those two elements work, work together. And in both cases, so once you do all the research and you gather lots of great stories you want to incorporate, um, what is the process for putting the story together? Like, do you use a formula kind of to to weave the narrative together to make a good story? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, how, how we learn it, uh, the, the movie making, is one, one part is that you read a lot of books uh, and you watch a lot of documentaries and other things of how movies are made. So, so clearly, you know, there are certain formulas. And for me, you know, specifically... Um, I didn't necessarily follow it when I was writing it, uh, but when you test it with people and, and in, in, both in writing and also in editing, then what happens is that uh, it more or less tends to fall into a certain formula. So, so my movies both have a traditional, what you call a movie world, the three act structure and, you know, beginning, middle and end, you know, clear logical order and ups and downs that are kind of like, uh, you know, what you expect to see in most movies. So mm. it kind of happened naturally without planning it. So um, because that's kind of like how people like to receive stories and like they, uh, you know, mm, uh, there is a certain way or a certain type of story, maybe most popular by Hollywood, that people around the world respond the easiest to. And that's what most uh, you know, movies made for the audience uh, are like. And if you, if you want to do something different, then you typically consider to be art house or, or, or like not, not maybe so much for the audience. So my movies are, I try to make them authentic, but I also uh, want to make them easily understandable for the core audience. So that also means that they, they somehow fall into certain formulas. And trying to take lessons from that kind of like, can you take lessons from what good, what makes a good movie storyline to what makes a good brand story? Kind of what mm -hmm. kind of what kind of elements, like what kind of formula could you use to like clarify your company story? Yeah, I, I actually thought about it, and um, you know, one of the things in in movie making, um, they always tell they tell a lot about this hero's journey by, by Joseph Campbell, which is mm -hmm. like a concept that uh, maybe first was brought to light by George Lucas when he made uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. and now it's been replicated many many times. So hero's journey is basically a formula when you have uh, you know an ordinary person in his ordinary world, uh, and then he has a call. And then he first rejects that call and, uh, and then finally succumbs to that call and sets up a journey and has many ordeals. And then finally, you know, mm, mm, wins and has this big fight and, you know, gets the prize mm. and then comes back to this ordinary world and returns where he started from. Mm. So kind of like this classical hero's journey that we've seen in so, so many movies. If you think about the startup's origin stories, then there are clearly some similarities. Like mm. first of all, they always start with the ordinary world. Like in Netflix, you know, the world's broken because I had got late fee because I returned the uh, CD, mm, you know, 20 days later. Mm. Or in TransferWise, like banks charge so much. And then, you know, there's this call to action or call to adventure, meaning that, you know, can this be changed? And then what happens in startup stories is that when you have this on a web page, then you typically tend to um, skip all the intermediate steps and you already tell like the first two steps and the last steps when like, the rest is history and you are very, very successful. But actually in a lot of the startup stories, you go through the same doubts and the same valleys and the same uh, you know, points where uh, you are trying to build it uh, and then you get so many 
challenges. Like everybody tells you, this is a bad idea. You get big companies trying to crush you. Uh, you know, it seems impossible to do it. Uh, mm. And then suddenly mm, you, go, you still persist. You always give up, but almost give up, but then you persist. And then su- suddenly you uh, achieve something. And, uh, uh, and that's what in startups is like when you find the product market fit. That's mm. kind of like in the movies is when you have the first big fight in the battle or when you actually conquer the main uh, main thing. And then you kind of bring it back to your home or to the world or where you started. And in startups, this is kind of like the scaling phase where you have found the product market fit. And now you have to make sure that it uh, it, it scales any, everywhere and anywhere. So I think there are a lot of similarities of actually how successful startups are actually you know going through all these different phases of the hero's journey and also how how the best and most memorable stories that are told like the transferwise one or netflix one they they tend to follow parts of this formula and um i guess once you start thinking about that kind of storytelling formula you realize just how Commonly, it's used in so many different movies. Like, just, as you mentioned, like always returning back to their home at the end after completing this journey, and they're in a slightly better position than they were at the mm-hmm. start of the movie. And um, and I guess one thing to bear in mind is that the hero doesn't need to be the founder. Kind of, I guess you can still tell the story in other ways when kind of like the hero is the customer, or the hero is maybe not directly related. You know, you can mix and match. Kind of, the hero doesn't need to be the founder. Do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, typically movies, they say that the hero is the one that goes through the biggest uh, change mm. during the movie. And, you know, oftentimes in startups, founder is the person who is there from the beginning. And typically if they're successful, then all the way to the end. So so that's why in a lot of uh, you know, startup movies, the hero is the founder. And in a lot of startup, like real startup stories, they have, they have been built around the founders. Mm. Uh, but but of course, yeah, you can you can absolutely build it around the customer or you know somebody else as well. Maybe that's more of a lesson for like if you're making an advert, if you're making kind of a one-off video, mm-hmm. and you want to kind of show more focus more on your customers. Your customer can be the hero as well. Yeah, but I think uh, 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 and you know, look, I mean, when you talked about the Facebook story, I think in the Facebook movie. Uh, the hero was not like Mark Zuckerberg, but uh, but they built it around another founder who mm. the movie makers thought more likable or more identifiable. And maybe that is also one of the reasons why what you mentioned for what you mentioned earlier is that Facebook doesn't so much own their story in a way that maybe like, you know, some other companies own it. Uh, um, and one of the reasons may be that... Uh, the founder is not maybe, you know, so approachable or likable for the common people. And then they have, you know, they have maybe not pushing it on purpose so much as maybe some other companies uh, that have really likable founders uh, are doing. What makes your movie very funny, uh, Chasing Unicorns, is that like you do show the less glamorous side. You do poke fun out of the startup industry. And um, I guess it's great that so many entrepreneurs were happy to contribute to your movie, but then they also didn't mind kind of being made fun out of at the same time. Um, like in your in your startup story, can you like, is it wise to kind of open up about kind of the negative points as well? Um, or yeah, I think it is. And I think, look, the most important thing about the story or good story is that it's authentic. Mm. And that doesn't mean that uh, it, it's necessary, like every every single bit of it is exactly how it happened. I mean, you simplify it, you maybe leave some parts out and all that. But it needs to f- match uh, what your company really is and what your product really is. And it needs to be authentic. And in every authentic story, there are both good and bad. So mm, I think owning up to those bad aspects is is really important and and uh, so i mean if you're only pushing the good then in the long run it's not enough because in, in no story there are only good parts you have to kind of so, show the both sides so especially in a movie to try to get across this how about what building a startup really is uh, uh, i want to give an authentic picture that has both sides and uh, and also i think in a good good real startup uh, I mean, uh, um, if you're honest about things you're not so good at, they can sometimes help you. Mm. 
So you shouldn't only be, uh, you know, if, if you only talk about good things, it's not really a story, but it's just an advertisement or, or some kind of glimpse of part of the story. And it's boring. It's boring, yeah, yeah. because nobody's perfect. We don't, you know, why, why is so failure stories, why we like so much about the failure stories is that uh, uh, is they have typically way more honesty than the success stories. And uh, they are more easily um, identifiable because we all have failures and we compare them to our failures. So I think telling a failure story as a startup is mm. even more effective often than telling the success story. So for instance, when I, when I talk about Fortumo, when we first started out, uh, we, you know, one of the first markets we, we tried to go was China. And uh, we failed miserably. I mean, we got nowhere with China. And, uh, and, and you know, we came back and, and we even didn't learn much. Only thing we learned was that, uh, you know, we failed. And then when we went to Nordic countries and we couldn't uh, uh, get customers either, and we also failed. So we had a lot of failures before we actually found the markets uh, that our products worked. And, uh, and, you know, Duplica, I think telling those failure stories uh, has worked for us. You know, one thing that puts me off is not just um, over-polishing the creative process of telling your story, but also over-polishing the technical aspects as well. Kind of, I know kind of, yeah, it's great if you are um, a filmmaker, you've got lots of professional technical skills, but, you know, anyone can make a kind of video on their phone and edit together on basic programs. And you can have some really effective, if you're a very early stage lean startup, there are ways you can create your own content, very low cost, like without a... Uh, without a big camera crew having to do it for you or someone scripting your story for you. So, yeah, be more real. I think so, yeah. And, and, you know, the key thing about telling a story is that you have to do it all over and over again and you have to use all the mediums. So, so I think uh, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't care where you tell your story and how you tell your story. You just do it whenever you can. And I think that's, that's a very, very big part of a good story. The tagline for Chasing Unicorns is Silicon Valley, the European way. And I want to ask kind of about like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great story about Estonian founders. Like what makes Estonia, what has made Estonia a good part of company stories as well? Kind of from your experience, having, you know, mentored so many companies that have come out of Estonia. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Estonia is a good example of a good, good startup story. Meaning that, uh, uh, you know, when I first, um, I started going to Silicon Valley more than 10 years ago. Nobody knew much about Estonia. They maybe had heard of Skype, but they didn't know much, nothing else. But, but since uh, we had not only Skype, but like next startup stories coming, startups coming out of Estonia, then uh, uh, like very quickly, five years later, Estonia was known as a place that produces a lot of startups. And that again has enforced... Uh, um, Mm, this, this image has brought people to Estonia mm. to look for startups, which has helped to create even more startups. So the story uh, that we're known as a startup country has actually benefited us in a way that, uh, that you know, people come here and, and they start uh, you know, looking for new startups from here, investors or, or, or customers or, or, or so. So Estonia has been really good in telling the story of, of being a startup country, of being an IT country. And, but, but, but this also has substance because we really actually produce valuable startups here for some reason. And I think both having the substance and telling the story is a really powerful combination because uh, if you only have substance but nobody knows about it, then you're less successful. And if you're telling only the story but have no substance, then you're going to definitely fail. So the combination of those two is something that uh, I think has worked for... Uh, Estonia as a country as much as for Estonian companies. And what do you think Estonia can offer companies as opposed to, you know, Silicon Valley or anywhere else in the world? What, why is a good reason to start a company here? Well, right now, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, the people, because we have now people that have been part of many successful companies and they have built, uh, you know, Skype, they've built TransferWise, they built Fortumo, they have those experiences and those are super helpful for building the next one. And the next one, the next one. So that that is a very big thing, and and of course, look, there are there are many reasons why why people come to Estonia. You know, uh, some of them are personal, some of them are uh, 
um, you know, more business-like, but, uh, but generally, you know, you, you like to build startups uh, in where many others are doing it as well in, in those places. And that's where Silicon Valley was uh, successful back in the days when it was the only place to do it. Uh, now there are hundreds of places around the world where you can do it, but still you would rather do it in a, in a place where there are other like-minded people rather than somewhere very far out where you don't have like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And even though we always kind of show off that Skype is Estonian, like that also was created by foreign founders and that's not something we try to hide. Like we're very proud of mm -hmm. the fact that we attracted people here from abroad and they, they, they just, Estonia was the right country for them to, to build their um, startup globally. Um, and yeah, we, we still continue to attract uh, people um, and we still want to. We're still very warmly welcome them into our very tightly knit startup community here. Um, and I do recommend kind of if that's something you're thinking about, oh, then please go see the movie Chasing Unicorns because it is a really wonderful kind of overview, kind of parody, but also kind of like very funny, kind of lots of lessons in there um, about our country, about building startups. Um, so my final question, Rain, is like how can people watch the movie if they haven't already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are basically two ways. If you're within Estonia, you can go to northflix.com or netikina.com or our Facebook page and you can just watch it online. And if you're outside of Estonia, then right now you, you can have a screening or online screening for, for a team or a company or a co-working space. And there are many of them happening in different countries all the time where you can watch it together with your co-workers and uh, and, uh, and have that kind of shared experience. And also we've done a lot of Q and A's after these um, screenings. And in each time there's been quite a nice and powerful feeling afterwards for, for many people. So you can, you can have your own screening at uh, Chasing Unicorn Mo chasingunicornsmovie.com. And I hope you put those links on, uh, on the show notes as Perfect. well. We will too. Um, Rain, we're gonna let you get back to making your movie, your current one. Um, thank you so much for giving up your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you've been listening to the Startup in Estonia podcast produced by Startup Estonia. It's been really fascinating listening to Ryan's story, and I hope you got some really useful ideas about how to bring your own startup story together. In the next episode, we'll be covering another very useful part of creating a startup with another very interesting startup founder to be announced who can provide some expert guidance on that subject. So use the hashtag startup in Estonia if you want to talk about this episode or if you just want to tell more people about the show. And thank you so much for listening.